Our next speaker is Mr. Oliver Watts, or Dr. Oliver Watts, rather. Uh, he is an artist, writer, and lecturer in critical theory at the University of Sydney, the Sydney College of the Arts. He works on the nexus of art and law, often using postmodern and psychoanalytical approaches. His PhD was on images of sovereignty in the modern art canon. He currently lectures on contemporary art, street art, and modern art. His recent research interests include indigenous contemporary art and the imaging of indigenous sovereignty. Watts has published widely in academic journals and in the popular media, including cartoons for The Chaser. He was included in the far-reaching treaties, law, culture, and visual studies, which was published by Springer last year. I'd like to welcome Oliver to the lectern. Thanks, Owen. Uh, that was a very serious introduction for what I'm about to say. <laughs> Um, I am going to go down the rabbit hole. Um, Michaela wasn't willing to go there, wasn't game enough. Um, so I'm going to go there. Now that is the Kardashian dining room. <laughs> and I'm just really pointing out that there's no art there. That's the first thing that I would say. Now, um, I don't blame copyright squarely for the fact that there's no art. It might be the art artists' fault that people don't hang art anymore. Um, that is uh, Mrs. Kardashian. What's her name? I'm pretending that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the office, also no art. A lot of feature walls, a lot of very expensive feature walls. And that is the art that they show. <laughs> Now, the reason why I showed these three um, are because there's no copyright, or they own the copyright in that, or they know the people that made that artwork, so it's safe to put that, that up on screen. I mean, I got the idea of this talk, really, um, when I was watching the Kardashians, and I noticed that the images that I was seeing, in every room, the art had been blurred. So, so if you look at the images that I've just shown, either art isn't shown at all, or when it is in the room, it's totally blurred. And so it sort of came forward to me through the screen, a bit like a Truman Show light falling down. You know, the, the idea that something of the machinations of the show was coming forward for me. And what it showed, I think, was that copyright law had created such a risk aversion in television production that they preferred not to show art at all. Um, so it was a sort of mannered iconoclasm of this sort of bureaucratic computerized hand that sort of had come through the screen. And I re realized that the bureaucrats were running the sort of culture industry and how we see and, see and, and, and read images. They call this in the television and film um, world greeking um, or product displacement. So, you, you know, you either blur or you cover up. So it's quite common to put a tape over somebody's logos or just to show little bits. But I think what's at stake is, is the culture around television and film seems to be a lot of harried and worried and anxious producers. And I guess it's a, just a question for the copyright industry, how hard do you push? And, and I think the answer is that it's going to be a general discussion between the industry, between the content makers, between the producers. It's a broader question of how we can get a good result for art in, in the culture industry. So it's quite common in television and film also to shoot a scene twice. So what's happened in the image, I don't have an image for it, but you can imagine, there's a scene where the art is blurred. You know, this is a very famous um, place of product displacement in um, Fight Club. That's another example of it, Greeking, possibly the best example of it I could think of. Um, but what's quite common is that they erase art just so that you wouldn't have to pay a licensing fee or that you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. It's quite common for film and television to shoot a scene twice 
so that if you can get the, the license for the artwork, then you can use that. But if you can't get the license in post, then you can use the, the other shot. But of course, every time you do this, it's very expensive. Every time you follow a, an artwork, it's expensive. So actually, you know, it's not in my talk, but I was just thinking that one of my friends works at Vogue Living, and they have an attitude where they just sort of go for it. They take photos at, say, you know, Malcolm Turnbull's mansion, and then they just wait for the artist to apply for, you know, like to be angry or whatever. And usually that doesn't sort of happen, maybe because it's a traditional medium, I'm not sure. But in television and film, and maybe it is also coming out of America and also the, you know, a different sort of legal sort of scenario, but it's definitely happening in Australia too, that it's just easier not to show art at all. So the whole idea of this talk was that I came out of this hysterical sort of thing like, oh my God, art's not being shown. And that was a few weeks ago, so I'm feeling a little bit calmer about it now. Uh, um, and I'm not so hysterical about it because obviously art is everywhere. As M Michaela showed, it's everywhere on Pinterest, it's everywhere online. So the idea that I had that art is invisible, it's not there, it's probably not true. But I mean, the question is, do we want to see it on television? Do we want to see it on film? And I do think, I mean, this is not the scenario to really talk about that, but I do think that there is a point of wanting to see art in middle-class homes, in normal homes. Otherwise, we leave art to the connoisseurs, to the Saatchis, to the super-rich, and art does just sort of disappear in the everyday home. And I think television does have a role to play in that regard. I mean, I, I looked at... Even in art documentaries... So here's Ben Lewis talking about Damien Hirst, and it does a cutaway to his own article, and on the televisual version of it, they've had to blur the Damien Hirst. And I actually know this one from experience because I've had to try and get this Damien Hirst image for a journal article that I'd, I'd written, and it is incredibly difficult. I mean, Viscopy were very helpful. <laughs> And we were talking to England, and then we had to talk to his um, studio. But I still haven't quite got the licence for that image, actually. So again, it's obviously time. It's how much staff you'd need, and just what's the easiest thing. But here we have on art documentaries the inability to show the artwork, even if it's just so easy to Google. Like, you'd have your smartphone out and that image would come up a million times. So again, I'm just not certain what's at stake with the idea that it's not on television because obviously art is visible everywhere on someone's smartphone. But I mean, I think that there is an issue of criticality. You know, how can you make a critical judgment when you can't see the image when, while it's being discussed? I mean, it just is a slightly worrying problem. The other thing is just on something like, this is another um, Kardashian room. Um, you know, I, I, I went online again, like Michaela, and obviously this is not a new idea. There are a lot of public discussions about the blurring of art on television, and people are sort of worried about it. And one of the lines was that Homes and Gardens Television, which is a huge production company in the States, with a number of television shows like interior design shows, you know, renovation shows, you know, the ones that I'm talking about, they have a policy across the whole network not to show art. So you just blur art, you don't show it, um, and you just have these sort of feature walls, like painted walls or just some sort of weird abstractions on the wall. You know, again, I'm... You know, so, so even someone like Berger, you know, that promised, I guess, that it would be, you know, this great statement of status and class and some sort of cultural prestige, clearly that's changed. And I think that that is part of a broader discussion of arts privileging and prestige in the society has changed. Um, but I, I still do think that, that there is a discussion about whether 
you know, as Roncier would say, that culture or politics is a fight for visibility. And I guess deep down what I'm saying is that corporate interests and the commercialization of culture is affecting what you and I see. And like to what extent that's a problem, I'm not sure, but I do think that there is a control of what we see very strongly coming from commercial and therefore sort of a, a legal risk management commercial sort of side of things. Um, you know, just this is a bit of nostalgia, but that's, that's the lounge room of Bewitched, for example. <laughs> All right, so just a little story. I mean, some of this idea, it did mainly come out of seeing this blurred art on television everywhere I looked, and in Australia as well. You just see, you know, the other example is that they do a DIY art project, as Michaela sort of mentioned as well. And obviously, if you do that on a homes renovation television show, you already own the copyright to that because, the, you know, the actors have signed off already. But like this is an example that I had. I was doing a video clip in London and it was midnight. I mean, I'd been working two days on painted backdrops for a video clip for a bachelor rock star was the setup. So I thought, well, what does a bachelor have? You know, it has designer furniture. You know, we, we're, I think they're Eames, aren't they? Or, or we're not sure, but you know, even that, that's the sort of an Eames chair, you know, it, it, it says sophistication, it says the Art Gallery of New South Wales knows good design when they see it. So I thought that our bachelor rock star needed the same thing. So across three backdrops, I had this sort of designer furniture. And at about 12, literally about 12 midnight after everything else had been shot, the producer came to me and just said, we can't use your backdrops without changing them. I said, what do you mean? So said, like, the designer furniture is in copyright and I've spoken to our legals, we can't show it. Now remember that this is a painted backdrop. I mean, you know, or, or do we have to pay the copyright license to those chairs when we do the Q&A? So to the, to the letter of the law, you do. And so in this instance, what happened was that the, the producer asked me, I said, well, what would you be happy with? What can I do to change this? She goes, paint another leg on the Eames chair. And, and these were my early sketches, <laughs> sort of the idea that it has a sort of tail. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's sort of like that idea. So I, I guess I have that first-hand idea of, you know, the, the, you know, how this risk aversion does affect the world that artists are producing. And so I guess that's where I came from. Because I'm coming from an, a, a, a line, too, where I have my friends that are directors working in music video clips or working on television ads that want to, in some way, express the world that they're living in. And the problem is, I guess, the more money that's being spent, the bigger the artist, the bigger the television show, the bigger the number of jurisdictions that it's going to, Every copyright law, you know, America is different to the UK, so that was a video clip I was making in the UK. Australia is different again. You know, if you're going to do work that crosses different global boundaries, which a lot of us are doing, especially if you're a musician or something like that, then you, the, the, the natural idea is to be super risk averse. Because there's so much uncertainty, not only would you have to check every license owner, you'd then have to check every jurisdiction. So what people do is just go, let's not show art at all. Or let's just cover it up. And I guess then there's the question of what that effect is. I mean, philosophically, you know, I mean, again, you can do it really well. But like, I, I would go back to, um, I mean, I, we could go back to the one at Fight Club, but I mean, that was even more effective or almost, that you create this world where, of course, Ikea would not give, you know, give, but then it sort of feels like a joke that the audience is in on. It feels like something that's sort of cooler and underground that you've sort of got away with what they call product displacement. But I mean, I think, 
the, the, the world that we then see is a very strange world, I think, because it, what product displacement is connected to is also product placement. And that's the second part of what I want to talk about. Because now what you see on screen is what has been paid for or sponsored by the products themselves. And the thing is that art isn't very good at that either. We're not very good at paying for our placements. So you get a world in James Bond where Amiga now sponsors and you get a strange sort of thing where the villain is wearing the same watch as James Bond. <laughs> Which didn't happen in the early ones actually, if you sort of... Or, or a world I think that Baudrillard very... You know, but it comes out... Actually, Ian Fleming is a very good example of it. In Ian Fleming's novels, on, but on the other hand, he was very particular at telling brands what brands people were wearing, what watch the villain was wearing, down to very big detail. But the example that I'm giving is Brett Easton Ellis in American Psycho. You know if you've read that book that this, one of the strongest voices in that book is how well we do read brands how well we do read exactly what people are wearing, how well we do read that the Art Gallery of New South Wales has an Eames chair or it doesn't, you know, whether it's a knockoff or it's not, and I won't comment on that. Um, you know, that, that we are incredibly well versed at reading that, and that is our world. As Baudrillard would say, we are in a hyper-real world where we do read across all these sorts of images. We do read across what he calls symbolic exchange, where the way we actually sign our status and sign our identity is largely through copyrightable material. You know, what sort of brands we wear, what sort of things we do. And, and Brett Easton Ellis really highlights that. You, you might have a two-page summary of what somebody is wearing. Because that is what, how we look at each other. You know, how high, you know, what colour, what tie, how thin, how thick. And it was actually quite hard to do that in the film, again, as an aside. Because some people didn't want to be product placed with an American psycho. So you had to actually talk a lot of the suit companies into doing that. Apparently also in Slumdog Millionaire, the Mercedes didn't like their cars being associated with a slum. So again, just asking that question, whether we care or not, I guess on television or film, whether we want our world shown, whether we want a sort of critical engagement with actually how we live in the world. But if we do, you'd expect to see a play of these sorts of copyright material because that is the world that we live in. And I'll just show this image because this is actually a bit of a, well, it's just a very problematic thing, but it's, it came from one of my friends also that was doing video clips, is that in the end, art will be a form of product placement. There will be arrangements which will be what art will be shown on film and television. You know, Will Clemente, you know, Clemente's paintings were shown in Great Expectations, for example. Or I've got an image here, I think my last slide, Harper's Bazaar have just done something with Francesco Clemente, who is coming out to Australia soon, I think. Um, but also Jay-Z using Abram Abramovich, which is, you know, also Michaela mentioned. You know, this was a there was a negotiation here. You know, Abramovich has money that needs to go to an institution. Jay-Z said that he'd pay that if, he, if she does this. It's sort of a co-branding. Jay-Z needs something from high art. Abramovich needs something from Jay-Z, though she ruse that she did this now, that she's sort of gone back on that. Um, and she said it was a terrible experience and she will never do it again. But this might be the future of art on screen, where you negotiate with these commercial interests 
And, and that is how people do negotiate the visibility of the screen. Any beer that you see drunk on the screen has been negotiated that the beer companies paid for that. If you don't see a beer, then, you know, if, if there's no logo, then there's no logo until they can get the money. So I guess the question, you know, the, the final point really is just how we're going to deal with this sort of risk aversion that obviously the producers feel. And I just give a positive solution to it, and it's an obviously an easy one, and maybe we can talk about it more in the questions and answers. But in France, like we do here, and Viscopy is definitely pushing this idea in Australia, the answer is to change the industry values where it is cheap enough and quick enough and easy enough that they will pay the licensing and they won't blur the art. And apparently in France that's very successful. Again, also they've had a longer time in the industry to create the industry standard. Um, but that's really the solution. The solution is just to make it easier for everyone. But the answer also is that it doesn't come just from copyright law. It would have to come from the television and film producers the willingness to just say art is important enough to show and we're willing to pay for it. But, you know, you're not will, you know, and how much, I guess it would be up to a negotiation between the two industries and to keep those lines open. So I won't mention who, but I did do a, an academic journal. Again, I guess it's an academic journal, not a big, pub, you know, broadcast, like Home and Away has 80 countries. You know, how much would that be worth? But, you know, a, a widow of a, of a great Australian artist was happy with my j article, so she gave the, all the copyright of the three images for $50, just a peppercorn, just to keep her side of it, the administration going. But I don't know, you know, that's a balance. It's a balance of time, it's a balance of staff, and it's a balance of cost. Um, but the French seem to be doing that well. Viscopy is definitely working with industry now to create those discussions more. But it's, a, you know, it's early on in our industry, that sort of dis the discussion. Um, but anyway, I'm hopeful. And also, I'm not totally worried, and now I'd sort of finish with this. I don't know, it's the big question is whether you want to see this on television at all, or whether we see enough art everywhere else. Um, but anyway, I'd like to see art on the television. And so hopefully a few small changes, we can see it again.